I'm an anesthesiologist and I have a skill that is basically a global shortage. In the city of Awil in the northwest of South Sudan, MSF run the hospitals where I worked. In that area, this is the only hospital for around 1.2 million people. The hospital has one anesthesiologist. By offering this skill in a country like South Sudan, I can save lives. So when you are the only anesthesiologist, even though you have a small team with another anesthesiology nurse and so on, and you work a lot of hours, this becomes lonely in the end. You don't have people around you that can help you, that can relieve you. You don't have hospitals nearby where you can send difficult cases or ask for help. So with this lecture today, I have three purposes. I want to present us, the MSF, as a humanitarian organization. I'm also a witness from South Sudan, and uh, I try to give you a perspective of what it's like to be a patient, a resident in South Sudan in need of care. And last, to switch from working in one of the world's most developed healthcare system, Trollhättan, Sweden, to work in one of the poorest. What challenges do you meet? I will try to explain that. I, all, I do all this with the, with the situation in South Sudan and, and the mission in the city of Awil as a starting point. And, and all this is really about different perspectives. Uh, perspectives on how you view your own existence and, and how you view the lives of others. So, MSF was started in, in uh, 1971, it's 51 years ago. Today we are running projects, 500 projects in, in 70 countries in the world. We are 63,000 employees from 149 different countries and 90% of all these employees are local staff in different countries. Fundings, they only come from donors. It's private, it's individu private individuals and, and companies and organizations, but without self-interest. So this gives us the possibility to be neutral and impartial in the humanitarian work. <clears throat> OK, South Sudan. Right where the red pointer is, that's the small city of Awil. Uh, it's in northwest South Sudan. That's where I worked, but we will get back to that a little later on. Uh, South Sudan is the youngest nation in the world. It achieved independence from Sudan 2011, so it turned 10 years last year. The country is one third larger than Sweden and has about the same population. Um, 11 million is in South Sudan and, and there's 60% Christian, 30% uh, with traditional beliefs and around 6% Muslims. About one and a half year after independence, in December 2013, a horrible civil war broke out in the country. This conflict killed over 400,000 people. Since 2018, there is a peace agreement and it's being followed reasonably. Uh, officially, there is peace, but fighting in form of clashes in between different armed groups are still ongoing. And the wounds after years of war are still there. Around 4 million people was displaced inside and outside the country's border. And that is, even today, considered the largest refugee crisis in Africa with 2.2 million people displaced in neighboring countries. And in these countries, there are armed, many of these countries, there are armed conflicts going on already. And, and we have 1.6 million people uh, uh, internally displaced, so in their own country. South Sudan is extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change, such as dry periods uh, uh, without rain and floods through, during the rainy season. Physical access to many places becomes 
severely limited and this makes it hard for people to even live their lives. It, it's even hard to, to, to delivering help in many places. And rivers and roads, they become in, in, impossible to pass. To drive a, a, a truck through the country is impossible. And the rainy season extends for over six months. Air transport is sometimes an only option, but it has limitation. In wetlands and, and swamps, the runways are often uh, flooded and, and it's impossible to land an aircraft. So this leaves only helicopter as a transport option. It is possible, it is used. The UN agency World Food Program offers this, but it's expensive and it's a lot complicated. The people are also struggling <clears throat> with medical aspects, starting with malaria. This is the leading cause of death in South Sudan and its prevention and treatment makes up the, the majority of, of all our operations in the country. So we treated the first 10 years after independence, 2.3 million cases of malaria. And malaria kills around half a million people every year worldwide. 70% of those people are kids under the age of five. So let's start a little bit at this with the kids under the age of five. This is a, a bubble chart from Gapminder, data from 2019. On the standing axis, we have child mortality, kids that die before the age of five. Lying, we have average daily income in dollars. The large bubbles, it's large countries with large populations, small bubbles, small countries. Yellow bubbles is Europe, uh, green bubbles is American countries, red bubbles is Asian countries, and, and the blue bubbles are African countries. So we see here, down lying below in the, in the diagram, we see countries with low child mortality and better and better standard of living ending with a big American rich country with low child mortality over there. And here at this side, we see the, the high child mortality rising to the sky and low standard of living. And, and it's only blow bubbles up there. And where is South Sudan and where is Sweden? Yeah, in Sweden, right up here, 0.3% of all kids die before they turn five. And we live on $57 a day. And South Sudan up here, 10% of all kids, they die before they turn five. And in South Sudan, people live on $1.3 a day. The, the, the limit for extreme poverty set by the World Bank is $1.9. So this means that the average South Sudanese would need a 50% increase in income to reach the limit of what is extreme poverty. Now we see maternal mortality on that axis and here we still have the, the yeah, average daily income. And in Sweden, out of 100,000 born babies, four mothers die every year. Sometimes it's, it's five and six, but that's about where we are. In South Sudan, 1,150 mothers die out of 100,000 born babies. This is data from 2017. This is not a history lesson. This is now, basically. For humanitarian workers, South Sudan is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Hundreds of dead and injured since independence. Last month in Aguk, an area a little north east of where I worked, armed violence between different groups nearby the MSF hospital led to the 57th incident of direct violence against the MSF operation. This is last month. So right now, tens of thousands of people are fleeing in the area and the whole hospital was evacuated. This is a hospital that provides not only the advanced stuff I will talk about later on with, with the uh, surgery and the, uh, the care of the mothers. This is also HIV treatment and diabetes. People come every day to get their insulin, but we close down that operation. 
So that has even more deadly consequences for the people, of course. <laughs> the official number of our staff that is killed the last 10 years is 24. Across South Sudan, hundreds more MFS staff has been harassed, beaten, threatened, forced into army or put in prison the last 10 years. The many armed groups who ignore international humanitarian law, we see that now in Ukraine, the same thing, making it difficult to guarantee safety of personnel. So all MFS staff is always, always unarmed and security is only available in, in, in the way of uh, we lock the vehicles, we have fences, we have shelters, and we have 50 years of experience in running missions like this under these circumstances. So <clears throat> as you see, there are many difficulties to overcome before you even um, can start running a project and then we haven't talked about competence yet really this figure is about 10 years old 150 doctors and 200 nurses of the south sudanese employee uh, inhabitants at the same time sweden with the same population as south sudan has 30,000 doctors and over 160,000 nurses. As we all know from following the Swedish news, it seems difficult even to run a hospital uh, in a Swedish context sometimes. And, and then we don't have the difficulties in Sweden that I've been talking about now. So uh, one asks oneself, is this possible to, to, to run a mission like this? Or is it impossible? No. Of course, it is possible, uh, but it's hard. And it, it's done because of the fantastic dedicated staff that day by day, week by week, year by year, struggle to do this, to run the hospital. And now the hospital in a wheel. Now we are there. Uh, this was my workplace last autumn. For over 10 years, we have run this uh, hospital with a maternity clinic and a hospital for children. This is the only specialized care in the whole area for 1.2 million people. Every day, I, as an anesthetist, together with a surgeon, go for a morning round on this hospital. So I will now take you through this round as a tour through the hospital. Um, the hospital, it's more like a, a hospital camp, really. Um, there are many different uh, buildings. Some are proper buildings, others are more like sheds, and, and there are several tents. And we're entering the hospital through the emergency department, uh, based in a shed, really. Um, here, sick and injured children comes from all over, around the clock. A few kids usually need a, a look over from the surgeon in the morning, 10 to 15 kids maybe. And, and the ones who, who we're gonna operate on, uh, I will have an extra look at them because I'm the anesthetist, so I will have to anesthetize them. The emergency room has some limitations as you, as you might see, but the children here, they get good care. And as in a Swedish setting with the emergency, room to get into the hospital. The ones who need to get admitted, they will get their space eventually in the hospital. From the emergency room, we move on to the smallest patient, the neonates, the newborn babies. Um, we have about 40 beds for neonates and, and some of these little ones we also have to do, take to operating theater and do surgery on. And, and there's some amazing stuff going on in this hospital. Look at this fantastic twin babies. When we leave there, we move on to the intensive care unit, the ICU. So what differs in the ICU, it's not like a proper ICU, maybe in a Swedish setting, but we can give oxygen therapy. So you see this kid has a nasal cannula with oxygen. Uh, oxygen has to be made from an oxygen concentrator. It's a machine standing on the floor. 
So there is no oxygen in wall sockets or in tubes like you're used to from back home. And this is a little problem because oxygen supply is then power dependent and power comes and goes. And even, even in, in operating theater, when we are doing surgery on a patient, we could have a power break. So then you need to be prepared with a headlamp and, and so on and take care of your patient. This doesn't happen every day, but it happens in a week. Here we see a little boy in the ICU who's getting a, a blood transfusion. So there's a bag here hanging and he is, he's getting a transfusion. Blood is short supply and usually not available in, in the blood bank. So every patient who needs blood needs to rely on re relatives or parents that can donate blood to them, which is a problem in the, in the real emergency phase where you need blood quickly, of course. So this hospital, <clears throat> has normally about 150 beds. And, and the burden of care end of last year resulted in that we have to expand up to 280 beds in the hospital. We now leave the ICU and we are on our way to surgical ward, but then we pass this overcrowded corridor with sick kids and their families. They are on carpets on the floor, waiting for a regular bed inside the hospital. And this situation lasted for the whole months I was there last year. And we arrive now in the surgical wards, the surgical department, where normally it's in two buildings, two long bed buildings with 20 beds in each building. But tents were, were taken in from the UN to cope with the extreme increase we had last year. So, <clears throat> and this, this, is a, um, this is an example we have two, uh, a two year program where we train local doctors. So we have two doctors that uh, now is this during round, they, they do this training program to become uh, independent working in surgery and obstetrics to, to, to um, become more, so we don't need to import this competence from other countries. And the tents, we had about 120 beds in, in, in tents and um, tents is the last stop for the morning round. So <clears throat> my responsibilities during this round in, is to identify kids in need of extra care, supervision uh, in a lot of pain or critically ill kids and to do an anesthetic plan for the complicated cases. This, this round takes about two hours and, and it's hot and you're sweating and, and it's, it's overwhelming and you do it every morning. But by far the worst thing is the children that we cannot help. The, the, they may suffer from advanced heart disease or, or maybe cancer. We can't do sur cardiac surgery. We have no chemotherapy. So these kids, they will, they will die there or send home to, to, to die. And uh, that happens and it wouldn't happen somewhere else in another setting. I want to talk a little bit about life in hospital, about the families who live the life in hospital here. I want to talk about the mom who's trying to make the day go by here. And at the same time, she is worrying about her child. I'm so impressed by these families and their struggle, living with their sick child, often a sibling, for weeks in a hospital bed maybe. And as you see in the picture, one and a half meter away, there is the next family with the next patient and, and sibling. Side by side. They live like this. Days are warm, often 40 degrees Celsius, out in the heat and the swirling reddish African dust. They families they wash and they cook. And another mother is comforting a little one who's sad. And one thing should be remembered here that these people, they have succeeded in something that is the most difficult in a uh, low resource environment like this. They have, they have reached to where the help is. So they have succeeded in becoming patients. The round is over for today. And you've had a, a fairly good look at the hospital.
this finally gets us to the operation theater, which was my my main workplace when I was there. Basically, it's two theaters, uh, so we run surgery in two rooms next to each other. Uh, the numbers is like in 220, we did less than a little bit less than 3,000 operations, which is a little bit more than 50 a week. And uh, to give you an idea about last autumn, where we did 100 cases a week, so it's it's doubled. So we were we were under pressure. And uh, when we go inside, we meet the local employed nurse and, and, and the coordinator for the operating theater. So we have a look at uh, today's emergency list. And some days it was maybe 20 patients in the morning. And, and after uh, some while, there will be added more emergency cases to the list. Uh, as I said, surgeon, anesthetist, that's the narcos lacquerer. The gynecologists are examples of, of staff that has to be taken in competence that we need. So in this operation theater ward now, uh, actually in any operation theater ward anywhere in the world, we, we kind of do things in three phases. So first we do the preoperative preparations. So the, in, it includes simple stuff like intravenous insertion here, so we can give drugs to, to the patient. But it can also be more um, advanced resuscitation or intensive care that we do to make give the patient the best condition even to survive a general anesthesia if it's a severely sick or injured patient. And then we start anesthesia in the second phase and, and thereby we, we give the surgeon the possibility to correct what is wrong. For example, stop the bleeding. So after we wake up, very simple. The, the surgical and anesthesiolog anesthesiological intervention uh, treats or even save the lives of a patient here. And last, we have the recovery care. In a wheel, this is a, a, in a small recovery room outside, and uh, it's important to monitor this patient because they because they will go back to the tent or to the ward. So we have to have a look at the consciousness and um, blood pressure and, and pain and all this before. And these three phases, they, they are well functioning here in Awil and, and uh, performed around the clock by a dedicated team. So, but they're well functioning as long as everything goes well. So most of the times <clears throat> that you provide anesthesia in a wheel, you're the only one that how, knows how to do it. Um, the dimension of teamwork is, is not what you're used to from, from a Swedish context. So me as an anesthetist, I work alone, especially evening and nighttime. And you, that means you cannot call a backup call. You, you cannot get extra hands with competence. So you cannot send a difficult case to a higher level of care to the university hospital or so, like we do in our setting. You know? <clears throat> Anesthesiology is associated with risks. And, and they are greater than in other, other activities in, in, than in healthcare. And I will, my, my responsibility is to try to avoid these risks. I give you an example of what risks we have. During anesthesia, a patient might vomit and aspirate uh, rice and beans to the lungs. And they go all the way in the airway and down to the lungs. So this, they can get really sick from this. So this is a known failure, a known anesth anesthesia complication. It can happen anywhere in, in Sweden and in South Sudan, and it does. From this, you can get so sick so you need to, to have treatment on a ventilator for days, maybe. Ventilator, you know what it is. It's, it's what we call respira respirator in Swedish. OK, so what I have on my, uh, my hand here is on a green machine. And this is the hospital's ventilator, the one. In fact, this is the whole region's ventilator. So this is the one ventilator for 1.2 million people. It doesn't allow for complications associated with anesthesia at all. We cannot even give intensive care to a sick child or a woman even for a short while on a ventilator. Except for myself, there are two other anesthetic staff. There is there's one trained nurse, anesthetic nurse that works independently and is a very important person for the whole functional operation theater. And there is another nurse who is in training, training to be that needs supervision and needs support uh, and education. <clears throat> so me and these two guys, 
we were running the two theaters daytime. And evening from 5 p.m., the evening and nighttime, I work on my own there. So in Trolletan, we are almost 50 anesthesiologists, uh, and we are several hundred specialist nurses in, in anesthesia and in intensive care. I think we have around 40 ventilators in the hospital, and we serve a population of, of 300,000. But back to what kind of operations do we carry out here? To give you a better picture, I will give you the a few typical patients. This, this pictures can be a little, if you're sensitive maybe, but I show them anyway. So we start with a kid suffering from something called multiple abscesses. They could have 30 to 40 abscesses like you see all over the body. They are filled with pus. This is, pus is var in Swedish. This is a smelly yogurt of, of dead bacteria and white blood cells. So children need repeated anesthesia and, and surgery to wash this out and they need intravenous antibiotics and, and weeks in hospital. This is a common patient. And then we have the snake bites. Those kids who survive to hospital are very seriously ill, often bitten in the arm or the leg. They need rapid resuscitation management from an anesthesiologist and then anesthesia and then the surgical procedure of fasciotomy. So it means you cut the arm or the leg open because the the, the poisoning and the swelling in the tissue from, from, the, from the snake bite, it, it, otherwise you couldn't keep your arm or leg if we didn't open it up. And then you need repeated surgery after that. And this boy is about to get discharged from hospital. As you can see, his, his arm is, has maldeformation, but, but still he's about to leave the hospital and he survived. Third, we have the severe burns. This is often accidents in home. The burns and sometimes even the snake bites, they need something called skin graft to heal well, okay? So it's done, you, you, you have a piece of healthy skin and you slice away the, the, the top of the skin. And this you plant somewhere where there is a wound. Uh, it's of course very painful, so you need anesthesia and it could bleed a lot, but here we see an example of repeated and quite successful skin grafts on an upper abdomen, a severe burn on upper abdomen and, 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 and thorax of a, of a child. What you see like looking like net is successfully transplanted skin and the red areas remain to heal. In the same building like this, we have 6,000 deliveries per year. It, this in numbers is, this would be the, maybe the third biggest uh, maternity clinic in Sweden. It's only Ustra Sjukhuset here in Gothenburg and, and Söder Sjukhuset in Stockholm, who is bigger. This is in the same size as north of Stockholm, we have Dunderhead. So we would be, we would be there with them. And 6,000 deliveries, one thing is for sure, they don't come without complications, which often can be fatal for the mother if she doesn't urgently is taken to an operation theater with competent staff. And we do cesarean sections. Of course, it's not the same proportion as, as cesarean sections in Sweden, but almost all the one we do there are life-saving. And we have a lot of severe bleedings as well. To give you a deeper insight in my working situation, I will go through two cases with relevance also to how it can be. Starting with a woman, 29 year old, she's the mother of four. I wake up by a knock on the door in the middle of the night. I, I ran to the Toyota Land Cruiser and I meet my colleague. It's a bleeding woman, she says, and we jump into the car. It's only a few hundred meters to drive and the driver goes fast. Streets are empty except for a few dogs. We arrive and we follow the blood trails from the car all the way into the building and into the operating theater. And there on operating table is a woman. She's conscious. I feel her pulse. It's weak and fast. So what has to take place now in this theater in order to save her life is emergency anesthesia and obstetric surgery. 
So this is a real emergency. Everyone with experience in anesthesia knows what I know, that this is a high risk case. The risk is even higher with, with me working alone without a team. And as quickly as possible, I try to put up what the intravenous line, the intravenous fluids, the intubation stopper and the tube that we put in her throat after we anesthetized her. The drugs, I, I, I have to check the ventilator and I try to be quick <clears throat> because if we lose time, we might lose this patient. She's bleeding. At the same time, if we're careless and forget something, we might lose this patient as well because there is no room for failure here. Finally, uh, I need to tie her, I intubate her, and it goes well. Surgery can begin. Only a minute after, the baby is out. The baby doesn't look good. The nurses from the, the, the neonate care unit, they try to resuscitate the baby, but that baby dies in their arms shortly after. But the surgery goes better. So they've been able to stop the bleeding now and I can I can see that she is more stable. Her heart rate is going down, blood pressure is going up. You get the feeling that she will make it, that she will be able to take care of the rest of the kids. Then we have Garang, a three-year-old boy. He only had a small abscess on his upper abdomen, up on the left, left side here, needs a needle puncture, or only one. But I'm urgently called to come to theater by a nurse. The case is already ongoing when I come in. When I enter, his oxygen saturation is very low. And the anesthetic nurse cannot ventilate him, cannot get air into his lungs. So, so I take over and I try, but it's not possible. His oxygen saturation is now even lower and heart rate is going down. That's a very bad sign on a kid. So we, the team, we try to evaluate what has happened here. And at the same time we do that, he goes into cardiac arrest, his heart stops. Surgeon grabs a scalpel, cut up along his rib on left side here, and it spews out air and then pours out pus from the whole entire left chest cavity. <clears throat> it turns out that the abscess wasn't so small after all. There was a communication up in, in, the, in the chest and the whole left chest was filled with pus. What happens when we open up is, is that air is being sucked in here and there's an overtension phenomenon that starts doing that, that the pressure to the heart and the whole pressure in, in, up here raises and eventually the heart cannot pump the blood. His heart stopped, but was decompressed by a scalpel and when I try again, after this smelly stuff has pours out, I can ventilate him. And you see on the monitor that the pulse comes and monitor goes pop, 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 faster, faster. And then the oxygen saturation comes. This picture is taken seven to 10 days after, and he's about to be discharged from hospital here. This is a, okay, I don't think he would have survived without coming to hospital, but this is also a kind of a complication that wouldn't happen in another context where we had more frequent physical uh, examinations and x-ray and stuff. We would maybe have seen this, so we could have handled it another way. These are two of, of many examples and the team performed, like I said, 100 surgical procedures a week requiring anesthesia. Some of them could be a little stressful. 
but many of them direct life saving. The fact that I was a part of this project fills me with pride. This is a selfie of me drinking coffee in the morning. I look pretty worn out, I think. We're on call for 24 seven on these missions. This mission was a, around a six week mission. Working for MSF creates a lot of emotions and, and feelings. Not least the, the, the doubts on yourself. Can I cope with the demands that are placed upon me here? And will I be able to deliver when it's the most urgent situation and all this? You're struggling, you as well, with heat and mosquitoes and <clears throat> stomach problems. I lost six kgs in, in five weeks. Lack of sleep. You miss your kids and your wife. Still, this is the best and most important service I've done in my professional life. And the world is an unfair place when it comes to the possibility of living a decent life. We see so many differences in economic situation, how climate change affects us and how some suffer from war and access to food and education. And not least, there are large differences in access to healthcare and medicines, but in this field, a lot has been done the last 30 years. So things are slowly moving in the right direction, but a lot, some still remains. And 5 billion people, about 65% of all people on the planet do not have access to safe and affordable surgery and anesthesia when they need it. This is one of the major health challenges for the future, actually. Is that low and middle income countries get this access. This means a functional operation theater should be in, in reach with competence in surgery and obstetric care and anesthesia when you need it for everyone. That would save more lives. And uh, with those last words, I, I want to thank you for having me here today doing this presentation.